in-house policy and risk management. When we talk about in-house policy, it means what you do within your company, the safety measures you put in place within your company. These things are normally would have to be documented so that anybody coming into the company will know that this is a policy that has to be abided with. You need not go contrary to the policy. Any shortfall would lead to punitive measures or sanctions applied against you. The company owners, management will have to provide certain items so that the items will also have to be used by the staff. So therefore, when you are entering the premises of the company, there's a policy that you cannot go into the company without a nose mask. Because there's so much fume, dangerous fumes that come out of the system that if you are not careful and you don't take measures to keep inhaling those things by using the nose mask, it will not go well for you. People will even end their life so short. At the end of the day, there will be trouble. So people are always told to be careful not to run into the difficulties with the law. So when you get there, they will give you a helmet. They will give you. Because when you don't abide by the rules of the company, in a warehouse where there are chemicals, you cannot put food items. When you are entering, wear something to cover your toe. Be in a reflector jet so that vest so that they can see you and you can also you can see and be seen. Otherwise, like it happened in Tama Harbor where a certain woman had been following up container because the children I was in 19, 1990 to 96 when I was in the port. Certain woman had been come following the agents. By the time they finish examination, they were trying to shuffle containers and rearrange them in the stack. Not knowing the woman was tired and was sitting somewhere, they put a container on her. Because she was not wearing any vest or jacket that can be still waiting in the background for anybody to see. At the end of the day, she died. So some of these things, if the policy is that at that time everybody should be wearing reflector jackets or wearing some helmet or something, probably it would have been seen or the helmet would have protected her head or something. So that is the in-house policy. The policy which is pursued or embarked upon to that which must be the rule in the company. When you enter, what to do, what not to do, areas to go. Some areas, they even draw lines on the floor. So that when you are entering, you have to walk by that line. You cannot go near any facility or installation and safety comes first you have to be in jacket you have to be in shoe and all those things i remember professor mills time when he was the president when he was visiting a particular installation he has to be in helmet and all that kind of thing the same thing happens now in gapua when you go to the port when you go to mps you cannot go without the so in-house policy is the company's effective in-house policy, which forms the foundation of the company's entire approach to safety, security, and dangerous goods. It, is, it also forms the base for successfully implementing specific projects in the future. So when you want to have a clear vision, clear policy, standards must be established. You assign responsibilities and provide basic rules the guidelines that must be followed, definition of everyone's job, whoever is in the organization, what must I do to keep safety. The management must provide the helmet, the boot, the 
reflector jacket and it is incumbent upon the staff to also make sure that they use it otherwise they will be trouble when you are caught and even when you are smoking you have to make sure that you do the right thing you go down to the safety area to avoid any accident burning of the environment or burning of the houses or some of the buildings there are certain guidelines that we use the guidelines identify the rules and procedures that all persons at different levels of functional organization adhere to in order to ensure that safety and security of the handling and transport of dangerous goods are maintained generally the guidelines often describe and assign functions and responsibilities meant for the authorities to ascertain to, to certain staff members and identify the incidents response processes and procedures so it is very important to have a clear comprehensive and documented in-house policy and guidelines once the policy or guidelines are developed it is vital to document them so that it can be easily referred to and its effect should be lasting so risk management what is a risk the risk or a risk is the probability or threat that the safety or security of an asset person or an object damaged or injured or lost or can be destroyed so the probability that this can happen is high the risk in finance the higher your risk the more money you make but the risk you need to manage the risk so that it will not bring trouble to you so risk management is a continuous repetitive process comprising the following steps in the literature risk management has been identified that is important and for that matter we should take certain steps if you want to manage your risk then certain tests will be taken the first one is to select the relevant assets and activities which are important to protect when you are about to transport for instance bomb or dynamite or petrol or anything which is dangerous from one point to the other remember you have certain assets that are involved you have the truck we have the fuel itself we have the vehicle driver which is an asset also and all that so you need to select those relevant assets and the activities which are important to protect now because we are dealing with safety protection comes in you define the related risk that will go with those assets that you have chosen for instance if it's a human being if he is tired he'll be weak if the infrastructure of the road is not good it can also cause trouble the policies and procedures that are supposed to be followed can be another trouble for instance when you come to the motorway and you see the Burkina Faso trucks going under that uh, Ashama overhead which is five meters tall in their countries they don't have height limits so when they come to the port they bribe and they load so much but when they get there and having paid their bribes trying to go under the bridge becomes a problem then they have to be offloading some of the goods onto the ground again sometimes they have to dig a hole to let the truck go through it gradually and sometimes it end up in an accident so 
you have to define the related risk that will go with the transport or the infrastructure, like all the processes and policies that you have. The policy is that roadworthy trucks must carry some amount of tonnage. The policy must be adhered to. If you don't, then you are liable to have problems and their consequences are there. So after defining this your implementation of the protective measures to eliminate the risk and reduce the risk. Now one will say, what will I do? For instance, when you select the assets and you add the various weaknesses or you identify the problems that are related to it, then you have to monitor and put in measures that will eliminate that particular problem that you're talking about. You have a problem that the driver is not properly trained. The vehicle tires are worn out. The engine is not good. The road bridges are not good. All these things are problems that can cause accident. So in order to avoid the risk, the driver must be trained. Then when he's driving and he's tired, he must rest. So when you continue with this monitoring, how effective, oh, the tires that have changed, have they actually done the magic for me? Have they been able to carry the goods? Then you know that your tires must always be good. So that you don't best tire today in the middle of the road, then you are driving behind another vehicle, then you hear the noise. Oh, sometimes you don't know what to do. Sometimes some of the cars will go veer off the road and go have an accident. So tires and all those things, you check to see whether what measures you are putting in place are actually protecting and or trying to eliminate or reduce the risk. If they are not working well, they are not effective, then you have to adjust the protective measures where needed so that you can have it. So the implementation cost of protective measures should, of course, be adjusted to the likelihood and the severance of the protected expected damage. So legislation and rules such as ISPS, SOLAS and others provide a legal framework for risk management in logistics activities as well, as will be explained in the next chapter. So we need to look at these things properly. There is what we call the cargo crime. Cargo crime happens every day in our ports, in our frontier stations, in our harbors and all that. People prefer to smuggle items out of the harbor instead of paying duty. There are others who would want to invoice, over invoicing so that they will smuggle, take in a lot of money, that is money laundering. Then others will want to under invoice so that they will pay less duty because the duty payment in Ghana is based on what we call self assessment. And then is on the base, is the base for assessment is cost insurance and freight. So if your cost is low, then you're paying the duty, low duty. So most often than not, cargo crime is described as having to include theft of goods transported as cargo and shipment and smuggling of contraband counterfeit and pirated goods through the cargo distribution network. It is estimated that direct losses due to cargo theft across all transportation modes total between 10 and 25 billion annually in the United States. See, 
see the amount of money which goes into cargo prime. So America has put in a lot of measures to ensure one of which is the U.S. Patriot Improvement and Reauthorization Act, PL 109-177. They have, however, they require the Department of Justice to establish a separate category for cargo theft in the Uniform Crime Reporting System. That has so much importance to it. But in our part of the world, it becomes the norm. People steal and nobody, you know, punish them and they go scot free. A large estimated level of cargo theft and other cargo crimes is indicative of potential weakness in cargo security, including air cargo security. Specific weakness in air cargo security have been highlighted in several high profile investigations of cargo theft. So come to think of it, the major cargo and baggage theft rings have been uncovered in JFK International Airport. In New York, Logan International Airport in Boston and at Miami International Airport. In addition to theft, smuggling is a problem for air cargo security smuggling of contraband, counterfeit and pirated goods and the main legal markets and reduce government tax and tariffs. Smuggling operations are often linked to organized crime and may provide support for terrorist activities. A large portion of cargo crime is either committed by or with the connivance or the assistance of cargo workers. So it's a ring, it's a cartel, cargo crime. Sometimes they will steal, even security measures. That's done, they can still steal. Happening every day. So a review of transportation security needs for combating cargo crime identifies six key issues regarding cargo security. A lack of effective cargo theft reporting system weaknesses in current transportation crime laws and prosecution, a lack of understanding regarding the nature of cargo crime by governments and industry and all that. So these are some of the reasons that people get away with the cargo crime. Governments themselves, some governments do not even understand the way these groups operate then because the groups are also having people in government, anytime there's theft or there's anything, there's lack of effective reporting system or control. Even when they are reported, they are left on the hook. So in certain countries, there's inadequate support for cargo theft and then a need for to improve local laws, enforcement expertise, on cargo theft and the need for more effective cargo security technology, including cargo trading systems, temper evidence and temper resistance seal, high speed screen, and all that kind of thing. Addressing these issues specific to cargo crime may also improve overall cargo security and could deter terrorist threats to cargo shipment. You see? Aircraft hijacking and sabotaging. There are certain countries that terrorist activity is so rampant that day in day out, people are killing and shooting, they are hijacking planes and sabotaging people because of hatred for one tribe or the other. A dramatic hijacking attempt by an individual with access to aircraft and cargo operations facility occurred on April 7, 1994. An off-duty Federal Express Freight Engineer attempted to hijack a FedEx DC-10 aircraft and crash it into the company's Memphis, Tennessee headquarters. The hijacker boarded the airplane 
in Memphis under the guise of seeking free transportation to San Jose, California. His only luggage was a guitar case that concealed hammer, mallets, a knife, and a spear gun. At the time, there was no requirement of company procedure to screen or inspect personnel with access to air cargo aircraft or their luggage or baggage. The flight crew touted the hijacker's attempt to take over the airplane by force and made a successful emergency landing at Memphis despite serious injuries to all three flew new crew members. So this is another problem which can take place at high altitude. We have recent cases that you can read over and then see the sabotage that individuals with access to aircraft can do is also a potential risk. So numerous cases of sabotage by disgruntled employees have been documented. These incidents of aircraft tempering have physically been discovered occurring pre during pre-flight inspection resulting in aircraft groundings and delays and costing costing repairs but costly repairs but have not resulted